I would like to welcome everyone to the second keynote speech hosted by UCL Artificial Intelligence Society and also give a big welcome and thank you to our keynote speaker, Professor John Dagwin, for joining us here today. Today's event will be split into two parts. First, we will have Professor Dagwin's talk here on YouTube, followed by a live Q&A session on Zoom where you can meet the professor and ask any questions that you may have. We will now hear from Zayi, who will introduce our speaker, Professor John Dagman from the University of Cambridge. As an outstanding computer scientist, Professor John Dagman achieved his degrees at Harvard University and then taught there, before going to Cambridge University, where he works as a professor of computer vision and pattern recognition. He has also held the Johann Bernoulli Chair of Mathematics and Informatics at the University of Groningen, as well as the Toshiba and Dao Chair at the Tokyo Institute of Technology. His areas of research and teaching at Cambridge include computer vision, information theory, neural computing, and statistical pattern recognition. Some of the awards Professor Dartman has achieved in his remarkable career in science and technology include the Information Technology Award and Medal of the British Computer Society, the Time 100 Innovators Award, and the OBE, short for Order of the British Empire. On top of that, he has been elected to fellowships of the Royal Academy of Engineering, the US National Academy of Investors, the Institute of Mathematics and its Applications, the International Association for Pattern Recognition, and the British Computer Society. Furthermore, he was one of three finalists for the European Inventor of the Year Award and has been inducted into the US National Inventors Hall of Fame. Last but not least, he is the founder and benefactor of the Cambridge Chrysalis Trust. I'm sure there are many positives we can gain from today's session with Professor Dartman. Good afternoon, and thank you for inviting me to speak to the UCL Artificial Intelligence Society. I will talk about the topics of computer vision, neural encodings, and the automatic recognition of persons. My name is John Daugman, and this is approximately what I look like, uh, as represented by only a few hundred numbers in a neural encoding that springs directly from computational neuroscience. But before, before we come to computer vision and person recognition, I'd like to begin with some remarks about another form of the identity question, given that you are the AI society. This is a somewhat more existential form of the identity question, who are you, um, which has become more salient now with all of the recent uh, rapid progress in AI. Brains and computers have long been used as metaphors for each other, and the, the idea of the cyborg uh, or a creature, something that's part machine or cybernetic and part biological or organism, uh, the word cyborg itself is a contraction of cybernetic and organism, is of course a well-established uh, genre in uh, science fiction and in films and popular culture. And recently it has started to uh, set off some alarm bells ringing um, and has led to some proposals that the only, for example, by Elon Musk, that we have to somehow merge uh, our brains with computers as the only way to um, remain viable or remain competitive, uh, given that within a few decades, AI will sort of take off uh, within a life of its own. And in that connection, I'm going to draw some comparisons between the properties of biological or wet neurons, especially their connectivity and their speed, uh, versus the computer hardware that we're um, familiar with. And it's been predicted for some time now that um, uh, the singularity is near. This was a, the singularity as defined by Raymond, Ray Kurzweil was that it's the time when the total quantity of intelligence on Earth which is biological, is surpassed by that which is possessed by digital machines uh, as AI. And Kurzweil predicted that may happen uh, about 25 years from now in the year 2045. If and when that does happen, it amounts to perhaps a kind of handing over of the keys. And that's uh, something that has recently set some alarm bells ringing uh, as an existential threat to us. We may turn out to have simply been the seed pods for uh, uh, AI as, as the, the form of intelligent life that replaces us. A somewhat more um, optimistic um, and even cuddly uh, vision of that future was formulated by, I think it was Steve Wozniak, the co-founder of Apple Computer, uh, that, that we might hope that the AIs will still like us enough to keep us around as pets. Well, time will tell. 
Um, I want to make some comparisons between biological wetware with computer hardware. Uh, the human brain has about 10 to the 11th neurons, about 100 billion neurons, and they make about 10 to the 15th synapses altogether. Think about that. It's just about 10,000 synapses per neuron on average. This number 10 to the 11th is as large as the number of stars in our galaxy. Uh, or also equal to the number of galaxies in the known universe, 100 billion to one. It's an astonishing um, uh, number of neurons. Now, neurons, of course, are very sluggish. They cannot fire more than about 100 times per, or a few hundred times per second. So you can compare that as a, think of that as a kind of a clock speed of about 100 hertz or so. But of course, they are very, very richly interconnected. Uh, they have both analog and discrete aspects and um, nonlinear and adaptive features. But just think about the ratio of the clock speed, a few hundred hertz compared to, well, your PC probably has a three gigahertz clock. That ratio is 10 million times slower than the clock speed on your PC. But of course, balanced against all that sluggishness is massive interconnectivity. Typically in brain tissue, there are about 100,000 neurons per cubic millimeter. Uh, and with 1,000 to 10,000 synapses with other neurons that are within about a three centimeter uh, radius, you can estimate the wiring density as about three kilometers of wiring per cubic millimeter. That follows from these numbers. You can also um, sort of do some mental calculations about the a neurite is a, a, a axon or dendro, a neural process that is how neurons connect to each other. It's maybe about a, a micron in diameter, so in a cubic millimeter, if you sort of stack up little cylinders that are a micron in diameter, you can stack a thousand by a thousand in an array in a, in a uh, cubic millimeter. And if they're about a millimeter long, that all works out to about a kilometer in total length uh, or say three kilometers. Uh, so with these rough estimates of the size of the, of the connections between neurons, it's quite astonishing. Three kilometers of wiring per cubic millimeter. And of course, it's not really possible to distinguish between processing and communications the way we do in computer science. They are inseparable uh, in, in the brain. This is just a little graphic, um, more sci-fi graphic, trying to capture the notion of how dense the connectivity is among the neurons. You see here an axon and a dendritic tree, and these are meant to signify impulses, nerve impulses traveling along. So it's really a massively uh, dense and highly connected um, system in the brain. Now, this idea of connectivity uh, between sort of simple uh, elementary units, uh, neurons, is of course very much at the core of um, neural network theory, neural network models, the most famous of which I suppose is the multi-layer perceptron. This is a three-layered feed-forward uh, perceptron. And of course, the idea is very simple. You have really just a kind of inner product or dot product uh, in a linear combination. So uh, the input to a given neuron, like this hidden neuron, is just the inner product of a vector of inputs from a bunch of other neurons that are, they could be input pixels or they could be just uh, neurons earlier in the, in the network. And and they have a set of weights, connection strengths, which are typically adaptive or learned or trained. And the input, this particular neuron, is just the linear combination of um, uh, well, it's the, the inner product between the vector of input and the vector of weights. And typically, this um, a neuron has some activation function, a nonlinear squashing function. Here, I've signified that just with a little arc tangent curve. So it's, it maps the infinite uh, line of, uh, in, of inputs, negative to positive infinity, into the unit interval by squashing it between, say, 0 and 1, or between negative 1 and plus 1. And given that activation function, that output then goes to uh, the next the next neuron and the next layer. So that's a classic sort of linear combiner um, neural network model. And that's not too far from what we find in, in neurobiology, especially in vision. This is a classic sort of concept from Hubel and Weasel. In the retina, you have these on-off cells, which are, have sort of annular centers around receptive fields. That means, so a light, a light spot means that uh, light falling in those central regions will uh, excite the cell. Light falling in the black annular region around it inhibits the cell. 
and uh, there's on centers and off center cells. If those are sort of aligned together, then you can, you know, you know, as inputs to a, a neuron in the visual cortex called a V1 neuron or simple cell, then you get orientation selective uh, properties like this, which is one of the more striking features of the visual cortex. You get sort of edge detectors with a preferred orientation, and that's the idea of the simple cell. And of course, these exist in both symmetries. Here, I've drawn it in even symmetry. They exist also with odd symmetry. And interestingly, they come in quadrature pairs with even an anti-symmetry. This is just one uh, set of recordings from uh, the work of Pollen and Rahner. Quadr is a kind of a double-barreled microelectrode that was recording from two um, adjacent neurons uh, with the same receptive field. So they were re responding to the same little patch of the visual world um, and they had the same size and same orientation, but they, they tended to come in pairs with this quadrature phase relationship. And that's going to be important uh, in, in you know, what, what I talk about later on, this 90 degree quadrature, it, relationship in their receptive field structure. So these are spatial, uh, this is the, the firing pattern of spikes in response to a sine wave grading that's drifting past the cell. So you get sinusoidal oscillation of the response profile. This is the firing rate in impulses per second, you see 60 spikes per second, but you see this quadrature pairing in their um, uh, phase relationship. And that, of course, is quite suggestive of a kind of complex number or complex functions that are used in visual encoding. These are actual detailed measurements of the receptive field profiles um, of um, cortical neurons. These are the sorts of measurements people make in cats and in monkeys with microelectrodes that record from individual neurons. This is the work from Larry Palmer's group. Uh, and you see the receptive field profile is kind of an impulse response function showing how a given neuron responds to light. Light in a little patch, a little point of light will either inhibit the cell, so the background firing rate is reduced here, or it excites the cell, so the firing rate is increased here, and there's some kind of profile. It only responds over this patch, it then goes to zero outside the patch, but this, we can measure this profile of excitability, uh, excitation and inhibition, and indeed they tend to be very well described by Gabor phasers. This is a complex valued function with uh, real and imaginary parts that are even symmetric and and odd symmetric, and they have parameters giving them a size and orientation, selectivity, uh, and of course a position in the two-dimensional uh, visual field. So the little patch over which uh, the neuron responds. And for about 97% of these so-called simple cells that have been measured in this way, their 2D receptive field profiles are very well describable by these uh, Gabor phasers, which is the product of a complex exponential times a Gaussian. I'll go into more detail about that later. So the residuals between the measurements, that's the first row, and the models, the theoretical functional form, that's the second row, are indistinguishable from random noise uh, for most of those neurons. And here's what they look like if you interpret the receptive field profile as a visual patch. Um, so where it's positive, it's uh, bright, and where it's negative, it's dark. So for example, this patch up here uh, might be a, a, a pictorial representation of this receptive field. You can see how it's, it's responding. It wants light here and it wants darkness there in order to get a good response. And you can actually form a complete code book uh, from these kinds of Gabor wavelets. Um, here you see a, um, a four octave range because they differ by factors of two in their size. And so there are five different sizes here spanning four octaves, each one a factor of two apart. And they come in uh, several orientations, oriented going around the clock in uh, 30 degree steps. So six of them to go over by 180 degrees in angle. Uh, five different sizes, as you can see here, and two different symmetries. You see this one has even symmetry or cosine phase, like like this receptive field, and this one has uh, odd symmetry or sine phase like this one. And you can in fact construct a complete image representation. That opening picture that I showed you was made in fact just by a linear combination of these kinds of uh, wavelets as a codebook 
for vision. And this, is, this has now become a fairly standard model for uh, at least the early stages of vision, and it's a front end in uh, machine vision. Uh, so to summarize what we know about visual encoding in the primary visual cortex, there seem to be about five main degrees of freedom in the spatial structure. We have position in visual space, that's two coordinates. Uh, there's an orientation preference, uh, a receptor field size and, uh, or spatial frequency if you prefer, and a phase, which can be even or odd symmetric, corresponding to bipartite and tripartite uh, receptive fields. And that is well described by this general family of uh, Gabor phasers, which you saw in the last slide as the top row. Um, uh, and <clears throat> um, the, the, it seems to be a fairly good model for at least early visual encoding in the, that we're now about six or well, eight synapses deep into the visual system of mammals. And so it seems that the brain's visual cortex sort of discovered during its long evolution, the valuable properties of using such wavelets for purposes of image you know, coding and analysis. Um, so now, on the subject of uh, face recognition, we come now to this other uh, sort of basic f form of the identity question. It's actually quite difficult to, to do a good job with face recognition. It's really bedeviled by the entropy problem because um, different faces don't look all that different from each other. And the same person, the variation uh, in a given person's face can exceed the differences between people. So the in a certain sense, you know, everything in pattern recognition comes down to one sentence. Is the within class variability larger or smaller than the between class variability? Uh, so do different faces look uh, more different from each other than a given face can look compared to itself with different pose angles or expressions or lighting geometries and, uh, and so forth? And that's the basic problem of uh, within class versus between class variability. Now, Self-similar Gabor wavelets, like I showed you a moment ago, can be a complete basis for representing any image. In fact, uh, this family, uh, you can make any image you like from this family of wavelets here, in fact, is uh, how I constructed my wife. I did not, um, this is Catherine Downing, I did not um, just uh, collect clay from the bank of the river um, as some biblical <laughs> religious traditions hold, uh, nor did I remove a rib cage, a rib from my rib cage, and a spare rib to make her. I just assembled Gabor wavelets, you see, 2D Gabor wavelets, you, see, just a, you can see individual wavelets beginning to uh, form her face. It becomes a bit more well-defined. And finally, she opens her eyes, you see, added some of these high-frequency wavelets up here and gave her eyes and um, she, her whole, eventually her whole beautiful form uh, emerges even with just um, a few hundred. Here it's about, this particular image is just a summation of about 700 of these uh, 2D Gabor wavelets. So you can make a complete representation of any image, including faces with those. And some of the re important progress that has emerged in recent years, um, well, especially came out with uh, Google's FaceNet, it was called. Uh, they made a real breakthrough uh, about five years ago. They showed that on some of these big databases, you could uh, even start to acquire fairly good um, pose invariants. Uh, these are cropped images, but not uh, they're not mug shots, you know, there's, they have different pose angles and expressions and so forth. And they re dramatically reduced error rates by training this huge network with about 200 million uh, face images. Who has 200 million face images? Google has 200 million face images, at least probably including many of you. And um, so with a lot of training and this huge network, which, which had 22 layers and about 140 million parameters, with a lot of training for a lot of time with these clusters, they were able to build a much better uh, face classifier than had existed previously. The, the, op, the um, objective function is quite interesting. It involved both positive and negative comparisons. Let me just take you through the, some of the terms here. They, had, they were trying to minimize a loss function. So the training process was um, trying to minimize this total loss function, which involved a combination of two terms summed over all the different uh, pairings of faces. They had a notion of an anchor, that's a particular test image, with a negative and a positive other image. A negative is a different image 
of a different person and a positive is a, a different image of the same person. So, and they had a notion of a distance metric that's just signified here by these intervals. They, the, the goal was to change, was to learn such that this situation, which is bad because negatives are closer than positives, to convert that into this situation, which is good because now positives are closer to the anchor than are the negatives. And you can see how you, this loss function captures those ideas by minimizing first this term, which is the Euclidean distance, the L2 norm distance between anchors and positives. You want that to be small, as you see here, but you subtract from the sum of all those terms um, another term, which is the distance between anchors and negatives. So you want uh, this distance to be large so that the sum of these terms is large and you subtract that from this other term, um, which you want to be small. So th that this will help make the overall sum small. And so this combination of both positive and negative contributions to the um, uh, uh, lost uh, the objective function uh, by this, these combinations of distances was the training rule, a very simple training rule. And that led to a representation similar to Gabor Wavelet's in which you have these embeddings, which are very compact. You, the code for each face is only 128 bytes in size. And then you just um, do face recognition by comparing, searching through a database, and you just apply a threshold on the Euclidean distance between the embeddings to make a decision, is this the same person or a different person? And that's basically how Google face networks. And of course, these face representations are useful, not just for you know making very compact codes, but you can also find, you know, find individual features. So here you see, for example, if you want to detect individual facial features, this image has simply been convolved with both the real and the imaginary parts of Gabor wavelets. Here's the, re the output of the convolution with the real part, that's the cosine phase Gabor wavelet, horizontal in this case. And here's the corresponding convolution with its imaginary part. So it's a sine phase wavelet, again, horizontal. You take the modulus of this image and this image, in other words, the sum of the squares of these two images that demodulates, it removes the modulations, the ripples that you see here, and you get this. So this panel down here is um, clearly responding a lot where the facial features are, the eyes and the mouth, and not elsewhere. So just to summarize, these four panels are the original phase convolved with the real and imaginary parts. And here you have the modulus uh, energy, which finds main facial features. So it's a powerful representation uh, for making very, both for detecting faces and features, features of faces and building a very compact code. Now, there are actually several different forms of the face recognition problem, uh, not just one. I like this uh, print from uh, Boilly, Réunion de Tête Diverse. <laughs> combination of different heads. Um, one form of the face recognition problem, of course, is detecting the presence of a face versus a non-face object. Another form is identifying whose face it is, that's person recognition. A third form is classifying the face, for example, by age, by gender, by ethnicity, and by pose angle. Uh, and finally, interpreting the facial expression and emotion, which of course today is called affective computing. I want to uh, give a really, really quick tour um, of computer vision for you. It's, many of you are familiar with computer vision. Uh, U UCL has a lot of um, uh, expertise in this area. Many of your faculty members work in image analysis or image processing and computer vision and uh, learning and so forth. So this, you will already be quite familiar with computer vision, I suspect, but I just want to quickly show you a lot of pictures that explain um, kind of what the goals are and why they are so difficult to achieve. It's, it's, a, it's counterintuitive because vision is so easy for us, but it's actually quite hard to, to make computer vision systems that are robust and uh, general purpose. So some quick examples of, of computer vision goals and applications, of course, we have automatic face recognition and interpretation, tracking of persons and objects, pose estimation, object recognition, uh, content um, uh, retrieval, image uh, retrieval based on content, image search, and so forth. Obvious examples are for robotic vision in uh, robots for manufacturing or agri-robots, agricultural robots that can do things that otherwise are done by stoop labor. 
you know, like weeding and harvesting and grading of produce. Uh, Self-driving cars are, of course, already with us. Huge area of applications in uh, medical image analysis uh, with non-invasive scanning to um, interpret um, you know, activity in the brain. And of course, there are medical applications of computer vision like uh, prostheses for blind people. Maybe we can develop something that connects to a camera directly to the visual cortex um, over here. Uh, and of course, OCR, automatic recognition of kind of fonts and characters and other things. Um, 3D uh, reconstruction, if you're going to do a hip replacement, you want to do all the, uh, you want to prepare the the, the appropriate uh, artificial joint before you start cutting open the person. So you need to do all this sort of 3D modeling based on 2D uh, on, on scans, non-invasive scans, and get a reconstruction of a 3D uh, uh, model of the pelvis before you can, uh, so you can make the appropriate joint and then finally perform the surgery. Um, when you go through security screening at an airport, this is what you look like. Well, not, not all of you, but some of you, uh, let, let's, let's not even go there. Um, this woman is actually Emily, uh, I think Hutton, I forgot her name. She's the head of the Transportation Safety Authority in the United States. And uh, that's part of the DHS, Department of Homeland Security. And she volunteered to show um, people what, what you look like when you go through um, one of these scanning systems. It's based on backscatter, which basically goes right through clothing and it picks up um, well, the, you get scattered back from flesh, but also any object that is uh, um, maybe concealed on the body shows up quite, uh, quite well. And here she is demonstrating uh, that um, uh, capability. And that's of course um, it's a sensitive area, a sensitive subject. And you have the people looking at these scans are supposed to be some distance away from the actual person that they see going through the, well, you can imagine the, the, the sensitivities involved. And of course, surveillance uh, cameras are ubiquitous uh, all over the place. So a lot of uh, use for computer vision in security systems. Now, one of the reasons why all these goals are so difficult is that, of course, an image is a two-dimensional projection of the three-dimensional world. And vision requires that you invert that projection from 3D down to 2D, you have to invert it and recover the 3D, a 3D model of the world. Now there's no unique solution in principle that inversion is mathematically impossible. So there's a sense in which vision is inverse graphics. Graphics begins with a 3D world description and you merely compute a 2D image from it. Well, that's trivial really uh, compared to um, to what vision has to do. And yet we do somehow perform this the task so effortlessly and rapidly and reliably and unconsciously. And that's one of the intriguing mysteries that in AI, how, how does vision work for us and how can we maybe build it in artificial systems? So just to take a simple example, returning to these three faces, if I ask you as human experts, which two images show the same person, you wouldn't struggle at all to, you, to say that one and three are the same person, even though uh, the pose angle is different. And as images, of course, one and two are more similar as images in any sort of correlation sense than one and three. And that illustrates this uh, difficult problem. Uh, inferring a 3D shape unambiguously from a line drawing is quite a striking capability. I mean, this is just a line drawing, lines on paper, but of course you don't see it that way. You see it as a as a 3D surface, a Bessel function. And an aspect of, of that, of course, is pose invariance. You want to be able to recognize objects, not only like heads and faces, in a way that's pose invariant, but you know, some of this object, you easily see that this is a chair that's simply imaged in five different pose angles. Uh, but even achieving pose invariant recognition and classification is not easy. Here's a, a, a natural scene, which is intentionally low quality, a photograph that is just monochromatic, black and white, and very noisy. Um, but you don't have any trouble detecting this as a scene with five foxes in it, even though they are sort of well camouflaged by their textured background and they have different poses and pers perspective angles. Now, what is this? If I gave you just this portion of the image to begin with, you would never, I think, be able to detect that it contains a fox. 
um, it's, it's a pretty significant portion of the um, earlier image, but you don't have the, the gestalt, the gestalt including the notion of a den of foxes in a scene and they have their heads and their ears which help identify them. If you were to start with just a portion of an image in a kind of bottom-up approach or data-driven, you know, just do edge detection and sort of signal processing uh, from a low level um, um, in, uh, rather than starting with the, the gestalt of the overall scene, you would just not make any progress at all. Any edge detector that starts would be wandering around in here would find all kinds of local edges and it would be all just nonsense and um, because you have to do this in a sort of model driven way. Have you been able to detect that this scene here actually contains a fox? It does. This is actually most of the one of those five foxes. It's that's what I just showed you is in fact just this segment uh, down here lower left hand corner and yet without the overall context uh, it's very hard to make any sense. Of, uh, of the image. So that's one aspect of how to combine bottom-up or data-driven approaches with top-down or goal-oriented or model-based uh, uh, aspects of vision, a very central uh, sort of dilemma in computer vision. And of course, the actual here's the actual image of a face, a human face, uh, which is presented not as a gray level, uh, you know, not, not in terms of pixels with different grade levels, but it's just a function, a plot of the pixel value. So dark to bright is, small, is from here to here, just the plot of the pixels in the image. Uh, it's very hard to make any sense of that as a face. It's the wrong representation, but it shows you what about the poverty of the signal data. Um, and what are these? Well, uh, God, I think two of them might be puppies and two of them might be muffins, but it, it sort of just illustrates the problem, the ambiguity of, um, of, uh, in terms of understanding image structure. The, the data is just too impoverished. So uh, face recognition, as I told you earlier, is bedeviled by this uh, problem that the same person variation easily exceeds the between person uh, variation. Let me just give you some illustrations of that. Um, first of all, we all, of course, change our appearance over time. You might recognize this woman as Harriet Harman. Uh, politician, but imaged over the course of 35 years. And even at a given point in time, uh, there are huge variations with pose angle. This is no change in age or t of time, but or of expression, fixed expression, but imaged with three different pose angles and fixed illumination. It's hard to even um, know where to begin to construct face representations that can identify all of those as the same person. And of course, everything can change in celebrity culture because of all the cosmetic surgery that people undergo. You might remember this is Michael Jackson. He started out as a really handsome kid, uh, handsome teenager, but he started having all this facial surgery. He didn't like having flaring nostrils, so he kept having more and more of his nose cut away. And I don't even know what I'm looking at here. It's, he's changed his race. He's changed his gender. Um, I mean, what, what are we looking at here? So it's very, I don't think any face recognition algorithm would be able to track these as the same person. Uh, so it's a hard problem. And here's a, here are examples of how small the between person variability can be. In this case, these are just monozygotic twins, so identical twins, where there's almost no variation between the two individuals uh, and indeed no current computer vision uh, face recognition algorithm using the entire face is able to make any distinction between monozygotic and monozygotic twins. So it's just, it's, they perform at chance. And even, di even dizygotic twins, so fraternal, not, not identical twins, are very hard to distinguish with current face recognition algorithms. Um, and of course, even you know, these people share 100% of their genes, they're monozygotic, but even people who share 50% of their genes, for example, parents and children, often are uh, almost indistinguishable in their appearance. Uh, apart from age cues. And even people who share no genetic relationship, these are genetically unrelated people, uh, can often look almost identical. This is, uh, these are called doppelgangers. I like this German word doppelganger, it means a, a double or per, double wa walker or goer. And these are just people photographed around London, um, which are com people who are unrelated, but they form these nice pairings, which are almost, almost almost impossible to distinguish, even though there's uh, no genetic relationship between them. So that's the problem of entropy. There's just not enough entropy really in different faces. You know, faces always tend to have two eyes, a nose and a mouth. And generally the two eyes are on opposite sides of the nose. So you don't have 
quite as much randomness as you might like to have. And of course, um, the other weird thing about face recognition is that um, although facial appearance changes uh, over time for all of us, monozygotic twins tend to track each other as they age, which leads to a very interesting paradox that at any given point in time, monozygotic twins look more like each other than they look like themselves at either earlier or later periods in time. Well, interesting paradox. Okay, um, let's think about the, some quantitative performance aspects of face recognition. Let me introduce what I call the biometric birthday problem. How many people must be assembled, chosen randomly, until it becomes more likely than not that at least two of them have a biometric collision, in other words, a false match? You've encountered this probably as the biometric, as the birthday problem. You know, you know the answer is, uh, what is it? I think it's 23. By the time you have 23 or more people assembled at random, it becomes more likely than not that at least two of them have the same birthday. Well, suppose you have a face recognition algorithm that performs at some false match rate. So some probability that two different people would be confused with each other. Uh, the biometric birthday problem occurs once you have at least this many people um, uh, assembled together, then it becomes more likely than not that you get a false match. So in the case, and the reason is that uh, the chances of getting no false matches among them, that's this expression here. They're all independent comparisons. That power, that, uh, one minus false match rate raised to the power of the number of possible pairings is less than 0.5 once this condition is satisfied. So in the case of face recognition, uh, a false match rate of one in a thousand is considered pretty good uh, you know, for most applications. So the false match rate is 0 0.001. How many people must you assemble together before it becomes more likely than not that at least two of them will be falsely confused with each other? The answer is only 38. Plug this number 38 into here with one in a thousand as a false match rate. You'll see that it, at that point, it starts to become smaller than one half. So let me invite you the next time you are standing in a, pew at, in a queue at passport control, if that ever uh, happens again, that you, we can travel, uh, just turn, or if you're in any other kind of queue, turn around and look at the first 38 people standing behind you, and you should spot a pair of doppelgangers if you are performing face recognition at this one in a thousand error rate. Okay, so this is a kind of fundamental problem for face recognition. It's the, you know, the phrase, the elephant in the room. It's a phrase that means the thing that nobody is quite willing to acknowledge and to talk about. And that's the problem for uh, using face recognition. It's just, 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 there's just not enough biometric entropy. I did actually find an image of an elephant in a room. Here you have a board meeting of a face recognition company, Megacorp. And uh, well, there's a problem they haven't quite been able to deal with or even acknowledge. Uh, it's amazing what you can find uh, on the internet. I'm sure this image has nothing to do with um, Adobe Photoshop. Okay, here's an actual picture of some meditators, um, probably somewhere in San Francisco. Can you spot, there are about 40 of them here. Can you spot a pair of doppelgangers among them? Well, I think this woman and perhaps this woman would be uh, easily uh, form uh, a doppelganger pair. Okay, so we need a different approach for recognizing persons reliably, especially if we want to do it not just on a you know one one to one comparisons, but to be able to search a database that might be very large, as large as you know an entire country, um, or on a planetary scale. Can we find? Uh, a form of an approach to automatic recognition of persons that is uh, much more reliable uh, with having enough entropy. Let me try to stimulate your imagination with this picture. There's nothing like having an ostrich in your face to sort of provoke your creative imagination. <laughs> okay, well, let me now come to the main part of this talk, which is about iris recognition. The iris is a property, uh, a feature of the eye uh, here inside the, uh, the eye. It's behind the cornea and in front of the lens of the eye and in front of the retina at the back with which the iris is constantly confused in the media and especially at the London School of Economics where they wrote a whole report about um, why iris recognition cannot be used for <laughs> 
in the national for uh, national ID cards some years ago, and they were just constantly confusing the iris with uh, the retina. And in fact, they, the, the authors of that report were I mean, they, anything that they thought might go wrong with the eye, they thought would be a, an obstacle for iris recognition. For example, a cataract, which makes the lens opaque, that's behind the iris. Uh, high blood pressure can affect the retina, that's way back here. And one professor at UCL actually said it wouldn't work if you have astigmatism. Well, in, in a BBC interview, well, astigmatism means a slight imperfection in the curvature of the cornea, nothing to do with the iris of the eye. So there's all kinds of ignorance and you know nonsense. People just make it up, make up reasons why uh, iris recognition can't work because various other parts of the eye might uh, be imperfect. Well, the iris is, of course, externally visible from a distance up to some meters, and it's a random pattern of great complexity and uniqueness. So those are the sources of, of, uh, of entropy, randomness plus complexity. The pattern is epigenetic. It's not genetically determined, although, of course, eye coloring is, pigmentation is. And it's apparently stable as far as we know, apart from some pigmentation changes. Uh, there are no, there's no photographic evidence for any changes that occur in the iris, apart from the fact that the pupil changes size, of course, so the whole pattern stretches and contracts. And, and you can have some tra injuries or traumas or botched, botched surgery, uh, botched cataract operations to replace the lens can damage the iris. But apart from those um, uh, exceptional situations, it doesn't seem to change in time. Now, I keep saying that it has high entropy. Let me show you a collage of some iris images. Um, these are, of course, photographed in the visible band of light, and you can see what a complex structure uh, it is. Um, a lot of entropy there, a lot of randomness. Um, the, this is called the trabecular meshwork. That's all the structure you see here. Many of these features don't even have names. They're just you know, random. You know, I think of this as the pattern you might get if you threw down a, a, a handful of wet spaghetti, or sticky noodles onto a plate. They would all sort of get all interwoven like this and then take another handful, throw it down, down on another plate. You get a different random pattern, a different iris. And um, it's all that entropy which uh, gives this pattern so much uniqueness. Of course, pigmentation does vary between people, and that's all caused by melanin. The majority of people, more than 70% in the world, have very dark uh, irises. They look like that, and that's very problematic because the cornea in front is a, reflection, a moist reflective surface, and it's curved, so it's a wide-angle mirror, and you wouldn't see any iris in an image like this from India uh, with dark eyes. But of course, that's in the visible band of light, and the melanin is what gives a dark brown iris its darkness, but that doesn't absorb. Melanin ceases to absorb outside the visible band. Once you go just beyond 700 nanometers, go into the near infrared band. And of course, iris images are acquired in this band, 700 to 900 nanometers. That dark uh, melanin just uh, all disappears. So this type of image, which would be hopeless for iris recognition because it's all dominated by corneal specular reflections, becomes this type of image instead in the near infrared band. It's, this is a very dark brown iris, but it looks you know, kind of lunar, like the surface of the moon with all these craters and a lot of wonderful structure and texture that can be encoded. The algorithms that I developed many years ago, which are used around the world now for iris recognition, of course, have to solve many problems, beginning with finding the eye in a face and finding the, the boundaries of the iris. That's called segmentation. You have to find the inner and outer boundaries of the iris and also detect eyelids and eyelashes. So those can be excluded from the iris code. And the, here's some linear differential, uh, integral differential operators that essentially do a kind of edge detection in curvilinear coordinates. You do a contour integral along different paths, like a circular path or parabolic paths around the image, and you look for maxima in the blurred partial derivative of the contour integral as a function of increasing radius. So it's the derivative with respect to increasing radius, so exploding circles whose radius is getting larger and larger. Find the place where the uh, derivative has a maximum increase. It has to be blurred a bit to make it uh, less noise sensitive, so we convolve with the Gaussian first. And the maximum the, in parameter space, the set of circle parameters, radial uh, radius and center coordinates, which maximize the absolute value of this operator, is how 
these boundaries are de the pupil boundary and the outer boundary of the iris can be detected and similarly for other path integrals to detect the parabolic uh, shapes of the eyelids so th these are basically just sort of the approach to finding and isolating the iris from the larger image and then i encode it using these gabor waves that i told you about earlier um, they're called Gabor Wavis because Dennis Gabor, you see here, great Hungarian uh, scientist, uh, engineer, um, he actually when he escaped from Budapest after the, after the war, he came to London. He's a professor, was a professor at Imperial and uh, physics, and he, in fact, he's the inventor of the hologram, and he, for which he won the, well, for his contributions to Fourier optics, he won the Nobel Prize in 1971. He proposed a scheme of encoding information, uh, uh, which he called logons for uh, the Greek word for order. Uh, we call them Gabor atoms now. Um, these are complex uh, functions that are Gaussian attenuated uh, complex exponentials, which actually have some interesting optimality properties because of the underlying they're optimal under the uncertainty principle of Heisenberg. Here's what, they, here's what they look like. So it's a complex function, a phasor, it's a complex exponential in the real, in the complex plane, it's just a, a, a an orbit with a certain frequency. The radius is nominally one, so it's the unit circle, but the radius is attenuated uh, as a Gaussian function. So it, it only exists in some, uh, in, in some uh, limited epoch and then it attenuates away in either direction. He was doing this in time, of course. I've just represented that axis as x here. So this little um, helical, well, if there were no Gaussian attenuation, this would be a, a pure helix, a spiral that just unfolds endlessly uh, over time. But because of the Gaussian attenuation, it, it lives in a certain epoch. And if you project out the real part or the imaginary part of this um, attenuated helix, uh, a complex exponential, you get these kinds of curves. So the real part is just a Gauss, a cosine wave times a Gaussian. That's the solid curve here. You see it has even symmetry. It's just the product of a cosine function times a Gaussian. And then the dotted curve is the imaginary part, a sine wave or negative um, sine wave uh, times the, um, so it's a complex exponential with a negative sign, uh, times the same Gaussian. So you have this quadrature phase relationship between the real and the imaginary parts, of course, and the thing just exists uh, for a limited place and then is, is seen no more. And these actually optimize the uncertainty principle of Heisenberg and Weil, which you learn about in physics um, in, in terms of momentum and position, but the momentum has a wave free, uh, property, a wavelength, the de Broglie wavelength. And so, uh, of course, it amounts to saying you cannot occupy a smaller area than a certain quantum or atom in the time frequency plane. So these are different Gabor wavelets with different parameters that give them different uh, uh, epochs uh, in t and they live in a certain point in time and with a certain well-defined frequency, but you cannot simultaneously sharpen up both of those. You uh, can become narrow in time or narrow in frequency, uh, but not both at the same time. And all of these optimize, they, they achieve the lower bound on the product of those two effective uh, widths or effective areas. And that's what's special about Gabor wavelets as encoders of information in signals or in images. Here I will just demonstrate how they form a complete uh, representation for iris patterns. The upper two panels are just two photographs, monochromatic photographs of two original iris images, um, uh, Caucasian on the left and Asian on the right. And the lower panels show the reconstruction or representation of those same iris images just as a linear combination of these wavelets as I discussed earlier. So up to this, it's imperfect because I have a highest frequency. The resolution stops at a certain high frequency wavelet. And if you look really closely, you can see it's a bit choppy because I don't include any wavelets of frequencies higher than that. But apart from that choppiness limitation, it's you can, you can build a complete representation if you use all the wavelets. The bits of an iris code are set by simply um, quantizing the complex plane into one of four quadrants. Here you see the expressions for the complex exponential times uh, bivariate Gaussian. So it's attenuated both in radius and in angle with these uh, bivariate Gaussian function. Here's the complex exponential with a frequency omega. I project the iris image in lots of different patches onto these wavelets. So this is a lo local patch of the iris in uh, sort of pseudopolar coordinates, rho phi. 
the inner it's just the inner product the integral of the product of the image data onto one of these wavelets with a particular choice of parameters that gives you a complex number it's the, and it has a real part and an imaginary part and i simply set the bits of an iris code by asking whether the real part is uh, greater than or less than zero. So that's equivalent to asking, does the phase or this complex number project onto the uh, right or left half of the unit circle? And likewise, is the imaginary part uh, positive or negative? And that question corresponds to asking whether uh, it projects above or below the real axis. And so specifying both of those bits uh, gives you um, uh, a quantization of phase into just one of four quadrants in the complex plane encoded in this gray code. And that's how the bits of the iris code are set. And they generate these very high entropy patterns. Uh, it's kind of a barcode. This is a picture of the of, the, of an iris code seen as a string of bits, and that's why it's such a powerful uh, identifier and guarantee uniqueness. The process of matching two different iris codes is can be described as this kind of uh, exclusive OR network. We have the projection of two different iris images, A and B, onto this family of Gabor wavelets here and here. We quantize the bits to set them as uh, the phase angle is quantized to set bits to be one or zero. And then we just take the exclusive OR of them to tabulate what fraction of them were um, uh, agreed or disagreed, which is, of course, what XOR detects. There's another aspect that's omitted from this diagram, which is the fact that we have masking bits that have to be carried around to exclude eyelids and eyelashes and reflections and other kinds of noise that may corrupt the image. But then, anyway, we simple Boolean logic then uh, evaluates the uh, XOR vector to decide uh, to assess, assess the similarity between these two images and make a decision of same or different, yes or no. And that's how the matching process works. And you can search databases the size of an entire uh, country or continent or planet, as I'll tell you about shortly. The decision, uh, the uh, distribution of similarity scores that you get from different people it hovers around 0.5 because any given bit is equally likely to agree or disagree. So you have 0.5 as the expected Hamming distance, the fraction of bits, a normalized Hamming distance, the fraction of bits that should agree when different people are compared. This is 200 billion comparisons among almost a million different irises from a large Middle Eastern database. And of course, you would hope that when you compare different images of the same I, you would get a much smaller Hamming distance, more of the bits would agree, so you should get a Hamming distance score down in this region. Um, and that's, of course, the basis for this decision environment for iris recognition. The actual distribution of scores forms a binomial distribution, um, famously uh, worked out by Jakob Bernoulli from coin tossing. They have this combinatorial term, the number of different combinations, uh, ways in which you could get M heads out of N tosses. And if the probability of heads is P, then you have P to the M for the probability of that many heads, and this for the rest of them being uh, tails or zero. And this overall uh, combination terms gives you the binomial distribution, which is what is exactly the solid curve here that you see fitted here and the, uh, the, the allows us to estimate the entropy of the population of irises by the standard deviation of this uh, distribution and of course for different uh, images of the same person well th that distribution is not so stable I should mention that you have to do these comparisons at many different orientations because you don't you don't ever, you never really know the rotation of the eye the the head may be tilted the camera may be tilted so you have to do these comparisons in many orientations and always keep the best match that skews the distribution off to the left a little bit so the mean then because you keep you're keeping the smallest out of many samples it's called extreme value sampling and the mean may be closer to 0.45 when you do the search over many orientations and that's what you see here for the distribution of different people and the distribution for images acquired from the same person but of different image qualities is more like this. It's not a stable distribution, but it's, it's clearly well separated. Uh, this is a British telecom uh, database, and you can this sort of clear blue water between the two distributions. And so you can do this um, matching decision with pretty high reliability. Um, there's a common widespread belief called iridology. It's a form of divination that tries to interpret the, the health of the body uh, or the personality by looking in detail at the iris. This is, this, these people believe that the iris pattern changes uh, with, with time, with mood and with health and, you know, 
for example, I've heard a claim that Irish recognition will never work if you're pregnant. Uh, why? Well, somewhere in here there's the uterus. I don't, can't find it, but uh, that changes. You see, if you're if you're pregnant, uh, so it'll never work. Well, I, you know. Uh, I don't know what model of pregnancy involves the iris, but anyway, that's the sort of thing that people believe. Of course, this is all just hocus pocus, like other forms of divination, uh, you know, palm reading and tarot cards and so forth. It's all just clinical fraud, but um, quite a big market for it. I may, I may have missed the real opportunity there. <laughs> anyway, don't be don't be fooled by iridology. It's all just nonsense. Now, the matching process involves essentially just a uh, bit parallel logic. We have two different, uh, and you, you can do it all in parallel. That's what makes it so fast and so parallelizable and so scalable. Here we have two different data vectors from two different iris images, bits signified here. The exclusive or is picking out the times when the bits disagree here and here, but they agreed with each other here and here. So you get the single ones and zeros. We have to mask that with the masking bits that exclude eyelids and eyelashes and so forth. And then the uh, and of the mask of uh, the masks with the XOR of the data bits gives us the actual chunk of data that uh, whose hamming distance we want to measure. In this case, half of the bits agree, half of them disagreed of the ones that counted that were not masked. And so you get a hamming distance score of 0.5. All of that, this whole process can be executed in parallel on whatever word length you have in the machine, like 64 bits at once. You can do all this in parallel just with a single line of C code. This is sort of C-like code, which implements all of that stuff on the, the data words A and B with the mask words C and D, and that gives you a result. And this resulting 16-bit word, uh, you, can, you can quickly evaluate how many bits are set in that, and that's you can do all that essentially at the clock speed. So maybe a few ticks of the clock, uh, 3 gigahertz, will give you this uh, result. And that's why it's incredibly fast. Um, there are, of course, some other aspects of this as a practical problem. One of them is spoofing. Um, they have countermeasures against spoofing. For example, contact lenses uh, are used to lighten eye color. It's kind of bling, really. This actually is me wearing a uh, contact lens. That is, um, it's used to change eye color with the dot matrix printing process. You see, every, every teenage girl in California who has dark brown eyes understands that she would be happy if only she had blue eyes. Well, how do you turn a brown eye into, into a blue eye? Versus you don't do it by adding pigment. You have to play diffraction games with, and that involves this dot matrix printing. And so you can wear this bling that will give you a uh, different eye color. Of course, it embeds a different pattern as well, but you'd like to be able to detect that as an anti-spoofing measure. And you can do that in this case by the Fourier transfer, the 2D Fourier transform of this image picks out the dot matrix. You can see the four spurious points of energy here in the Fourier plane. They have a, a, a pitch. They, the, this radius distance corresponds to the frequency, the pitch of the dot matrix and the orientation. The dipole angle is the angle of the dot matrix process. So that's one way to detect printed contact lenses. Another way is the fact that a contact lens floats uh, on the surface of the cornea on the outside of the eye on the spherical surface. This is again me wearing uh, a contact lens I made up actually with the uh, iris code of the Afghan girl, which I identified. Uh, but you can see here with the oblique imaging and close-up imaging, and you can see it, this pattern is actually sitting on a spherical surface, whereas the true iris pattern lives uh, in a plane inside the eye. So that's one other way to detect contact lenses. And of course, finally, the pupil size of a living iris is oscillating, always changing in size, even without, without changing the light level, or you can drive the light level, and the contact lens won't track uh, the, that, won't stretch along with the pupil. And an, importance, uh, an example of the importance of high entropy has been really demonstrated in India. The UIDAI, Unique Identification Authority of India, has enrolled the entire population of India, 1.3 billion people, uh, using iris patterns. They also enrolled fingerprints. A massive project, you know, 36,000 stations had to do about a million persons a day in total um, in order to, uh, in to uh, enroll 1.3 billion people in a few years. And that required a due deed 
deduplication stage, which compared everybody against everybody else. So 10 to the 15 comparisons per day. You can do that because of the high entropy and the great speed of the IRIS code. Here's some pictures of this uh, being used in India for a national, it's a national ID system for welfare distribution and providing subsidies and e-government services also. It's a general ID scheme, which is now very successfully rolled out all across India. And NIST did some studies of the accuracy of face recognition compared to iris recognition. And uh, they showed that because of the much greater entropy, NIST is the National Institute of Standards and Technologies in the USA, the false match rate for iris codes was 100,000 times lower than the false match rate for face recognition. And also the false non-match rate was for iris codes was 10 times lower than face recognition. So in this log-log plots, you can see here the best decision error trade-off curves for face recognition were many orders of magnitude worse than the best results for iris recognition. So there's, uh, there's no contest between iris and face recognition in terms of accuracy. I mentioned they are epigenetic. Of course, all um, traits lie somewhere on a continuum between genotypic and epigenetic. T identical twins have no correlation in their iris patterns. The faces look very similar, but these, if you look in detail, the face structure of their iris patterns are uncorrelated, and indeed you get the same distribution as you get for unrelated people. 18-year-old women, same story, and 78-year-old men, same story. Now, Iris image acquisition is tricky, and in some of the early iris recognition systems, um, it was sort of an in-your-face camera. The uh, iris recognition, the interface was not always as convenient or user-friendly as it might have been or should have been. It felt a bit like this, I suppose, <laughs> sort of in your face. But of course now, uh, if you go to Gatwick Airport, they have uh, iris cameras that work at a standoff distance of about two meters. Um, and the capture volume is about a cubic meter, and you can even do it while walking uh, uh, through a portal. Here's a nice demonstration, walking through a portal uh, in, uh, developed at uh, Princeton uh, uh, Sarnoff Labs, uh, and you can have people walking even at a speed of one meter per second, capturing images at 15 frames a second. You, that means the frames are about six centimeters apart in the uh, captured uh, distance, and that can be within the field of view, the uh, depth of field uh, of the camera. Uh, this is, of course, a race. Uh, always pe people want to do it at a greater and greater distance. So I've heard that the Iris, the Hubble camera, the Hubble Space Telescope, is um, going to be decommissioned. And so I have a proposal to, for the Hubble Iris camera. You see, it will um, maybe that's a way to win the, the race, the space race, to make Iris recognition work at an ever greater distance, which is what people try to do. Finally, I'll close with some pictures of deployments. Uh, you can cross many national borders. The U.S.-Canadian border can be crossed with, without, and, and indeed for about 10 years, you could do it at Heathrow and about 10 uh, U.K. airport terminals without having to present your passport. If you're enrolled in the system, your iris code is in the database, then you just walk past the, cam to the camera and within a second or two, this other gate opens and you go right through without even having asserted your identity or having shown your passport because it could do a search that quickly through the en enrolled database. In that case, it was only a few million people uh, be over the course of the 10 years when the program expired. It's now replaced with RFID passports. But anyhow, uh, a lot of border crossings around the world, Schiphol Airport and many other places use this. In the UAE, it's used for visa uh, application and registration. Uh, about 80% about of the people who live in the, U, in the United Arab Emirates are not nationals, they're foreign uh, nationals. Um, this is also used for residency permit applications. You have to be culturally sensitive, of course, in the Islamic world. Um, a woman cannot show her face to a stranger, except in the presence of other male members of her family. And you also cannot ask her to uh, expose her hand and touch something like a fingerprint reader. But you can, <laughs> through the burqa or face veil, you can actually get an image of the iris. And this is what you see in the infrared light here. You see the bottom and top of the veil. And there's the iris image. And it can be used uh, even uh, for a woman in a full veil. I told you about the UIDAI in India, in which the iris patterns were enrolled for the entire population of India. I did the identification of the Afghan girl. You might remember Sharbat Gula, 
many, she, after this space of about 18 years, she was found, she was a, an orphan after the first uh, Taliban, uh, sorry, after the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan uh, in 19, uh, early 1980s. Her parents were killed, she was an orphan. Very famous, iconic photograph. 18 years later, here she is as a 30 year old woman, and I was able to identify the iris patterns for National Geographic when they brought me the uh, images of her together with other candidates who were claiming the identity falsely. And here was uh, some images of that appear for a second time on National Geographic. And actually they put me on the cover the third time with those contact lenses for a third issue of the magazine uh, on the subject of security. So this story actually appeared three times in National Geographic. Uh, the reason it could work after 18 years is that, as far as we know, the iris scores are the iris scores are stable. The iris pattern is st stable. These are some time series data acquired by again by NIST. Two different deployments um, involving airports over the course of about uh, nine years, uh, six years, and nine years. Uh, one's for airports, one is for Department of Defense field deployments. And you can see the histogram of Hamming-Nielsen scores is very stable uh, over all that period of time. So there's no evidence for changes in the iris pattern over time. Finally, Bill Gates invited me to speak to him about the uh, potential application of this with um, the vaccination programs in third world countries where there may not exist reliable uh, records of vaccinations, uh, uh, no paper, reliable paperwork. You could try to enroll toddlers um, by their iris patterns, uh, enroll the iris code in a database, use that uh, if you identify the iris code use that to to query a clinical database with vaccination records and this um there are uncertainties about whether this will work with children and toddlers because they squirm a lot they they don't like having to look at a camera and they don't know what a camera is and so there are ergonomic human factors issues that remain to be resolved but this is a potential uh, future application of iris recognition for vaccination uh, uh, record keeping. And with that, I will uh, close this talk. Thank you for listening, and I'd be happy to take any questions.